Welcome to the Waste Not What Not podcast. I'm Philippa Ross, human ecologist, enthusiologist, author and energy healer, bringing you inspirational interviews, news and tips to rebuild the relationship between people and the planet the way nature intended by revitalizing our natural resources, minimizing waste and maximizing human potential. I trust you'll discover seeds of hope for a vibrant future so you can cultivate and transform them to suit your own lifestyle in order for us to collectively create a world where reverence for the diversity of all life is honoured. You'll find all the show notes in the description and lots more about me and my work at philipparos.com. And don't forget, if you like what you hear, be sure to share far and wide. Hello, Wastebusters. Welcome to episode 35. Today's episode is totally dedicated to celebrating the very first World Krill Day with my esteemed guest, Dr. Rodolfo Werner. And because I live in New Zealand, I have the privilege to present the first of many global events to highlight the crucial role these microscopic ocean heroes play in the Antarctic region and how, in turn, they impact the delicate dynamics of the interconnected web of all the ecosystems that sustain life here on planet Earth. It can be hard to get your head around the fact that a continent at the bottom of the world affects us, and we it, no matter where we live. But it does. A fact that was recently demonstrated when the volcanic afterglow of the Hunga Tonga Hunga Hapai volcano that erupted in January of this year lit up the skies at Scott Basin, Antarctica, six months after the event. It was a timely reminder that while we may not see the consequences of what we do immediately, the ripple effect is gathering momentum and will show up somewhere at some later time. The whole premise of my podcast is to help you appreciate the link between people and the planet and to build a relationship that honours that connection we have with Mother Earth. And as you'll know, if you've been following me, I launched the podcast on the 1st of December, being Antarctic Day, because the region has a very special place in my heart. As does my guest, Dr. Rodolfo Verno, marine biologist, wildlife conservationist, science and policy advisor, who has dedicated decades of his life working as a consultant alongside organisations like the Antarctic and Southern Ocean Coalition, the Pew Charitable Trust and the Antarctic Wildlife Research Fund to protect and preserve this precious continent. I trust our conversation will light up your life with hope and help you appreciate how these mighty microscopic pink crustaceans are critically important to offset the human carbon print and crucial to sustaining a healthy ecosystem for us all to thrive. It's my absolute delight to have my dear friend and a fellow ambassador of Antarctica, Dr. Rodolfo Werner, with me today from Argentina, because we're celebrating the very first World Cruel Day. Welcome to the show, Rodolfo. Yeah, thank you very much, and I'm very, very happy to be here today. So, World Krill Day, why krill? Why make a special day of it, and why now? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. First of all, probably the question, like you said, is why krill? Yeah. And krill, as you know, is the basis of the trophic web of the Antarctic marine ecosystem. And that means that every species in Antarctica feeds on krill or on something that feeds on krill. So krill is the keystone species for Antarctica. And so we've been working on the protection of krill, conservation of krill in Antarctica at large for many years now, so almost 20 years. And for many years, we've been thinking about the need to have a special day for krill where we can celebrate the existence of this marvelous creature. And so we, we made it this year. And so we were putting a lot of energy and effort in, in, in coming up with this International World Krill Day in which we are having people all over the world do things, initiative, webinars, articles, postings, and so on, so that we raise the awareness about the importance of krill. So I'm very happy that after many years of having thought about this, we are finally making it happen. Is there any significance to the actual date being today, the 11th of August? I like that question because I had that question posed to me several times already. (laughs) And I would say no. I mean, there's no reason why August 11th is the work group day. 
the reason why we pick up that day is because it's sort of not the end, but we're getting to the end of the austral winter. So the sort of mid end of August. So spring is coming along. So in the life cycle of krill, that's important because that's when you know, krill has been moving from being a little egg and going through different larvae stages to become a juvenile or adult individual. And also because we are like two months away from the Camelar meeting, the meeting of the convention that regulates all the fishing of Antarctic krill. And so it's a good day to kind of highlight the importance of krill. If you want in preparation for that important meeting that takes place every year in Hobart, in Tasmania, in Australia. And so it gives us, you know, a couple of months before the meeting in order to increase the attention of the public in preparation for that important meeting where all these decisions on the management of the the Antarctic krill fishery and, of course, the conservation of krill are going to happen. Because that's where we met nearly 10 years ago. And it was the same year that the Last Ocean film was created. And that feeds into it nicely because it actually reached people who are not involved in preservation for or conservation of Antarctica. And it's reached the general public. And I think the beauty of having a day like this is it is the education thing because... Funnily enough, last week when I went to Toastmasters in the morning, I was talking to a girlfriend there and she said she'd just been reading something that morning. She was asking me about my podcast and I told her what it was about and that I was going to be interviewing yourself about Krill. And she said, well, that's really funny. I was reading this book before I came out this morning about Krill oil being good for your health because it is a good deterrent for Alzheimer's. And I said, well, that's exactly why people need to know this. We all know fish oil is good, but nobody really thinks about where it comes from. It's, you know, you go to the supermarket or the pharmacy or whatever and go and get a a few capsules or something. And you don't see the implications of what's in that for you and the impact it actually has. And I said, you know, if it were me, I'd be looking at what is the root cause of Alzheimer's and what can you do as opposed to just taking something just in case and she was just fascinated by it so as you say it really educates people they're tiny little things and my mum used to say to me because I was always whinging that I was so small and she said the best things come in small parcels just doing some research myself on them it was amazing what they do for the entire ecosystem such a little tiny thing as you say it's the bottom of the food chain but gosh they pack some power don't they yeah no i think what you're explaining is it's a very important thing and while you were saying all this, I was thinking many opportunities where I find myself sitting in a taxi and talking to a taxi driver and, you know, we start a conversation. And then I give the Antarctica 101 lecture, you know, on the Antarctic Treaty and so on. Because, you know, every opportunity you have to, to talk to people that are not really aware about Antarctica. And I guess in the case of krill oil and, and this kind of nutraceutical products, it applies to probably... Most of the things that we eat or, or drink, we don't think twice about, you know, the, the sources. And in our case, you know, since we're working on this, I think it's very important to spread the word. And so people are really understand uh, it's not, you know, talking about against you having your krill oil pill, but at least you know where it's coming from, what is at stake, what are the things that you could do, or at least, you know, be aware. And if the time comes, uh, you could also be putting some pressure, if you want, at your local government, at your national government, in order to get things done in the right way. I think it's very important, that educational aspect. And I think that, I mean, educational aspect is something that always is in my mind when I also talk to, for example, delegates, like, you know, politicians. Sometimes they are kind of distant from the real issues, and so it's important to bring the science that lies behind all the decisions that they will need to take and, and bring them to them and, and educate them about what it means and so on, because science can be very complicated sometimes. Yeah. So I think this educational component is key, and so I'm very happy that you're raising that. Absolutely. And I think one of the important things is that mm -hmm. you and I have had the privilege of going there, and you've been there a number of times, and it is very humble experience actually going there. And because it's right at the bottom of the world and very few people get that opportunity, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. And it's really like the krill, bring it to the forefront of people's minds 
to see why it's important and help them realize that it is relatable to their everyday life. So what we do here has an impact down there and vice versa. And it is only one ocean yeah. and the waters yeah. travel around the world. Yeah, I think that that's very important. And, and this is one of the, the first things that is important that people understand. And is what is Antarctica like? I mean, how, how do we relate to Antarctica? Many people will know, but not everybody that in 61, the, the Antarctic Treaty was established. And, and I will speak a bit about the treaty, but at that point, you have to think that it was like 15 years after the Second World War. So the, the world was a very touched by war. And yeah. so, and there were some countries that they had sovereignty claims over pieces of Antarctica. And, you know, it was very hard, like from a political perspective back then. And so some kind of people with a good leadership, they started promoting this and the Antarctic Treaty came to place, which basically what it did is that it, it put all the, the water and the land south of 60 degrees south as a place for peace and science, where there are no um, national sovereignties. All the claims that were happening at that time are, by the treaty, are recognized, but they're being frozen. So right now, Antarctica and like south of 60 degrees south is a place for peace and sign. So it belongs to everybody. And it's the only place in the world that has such a treaty. There's no other world, place in the world and there will be no other place in the world. And this is why it is so important because it belongs to all of us. So whatever happens there, it's our responsibility, even if we are far away from there. So we have a saying there. We should express our concerns and our ideas about what should be done there. So uh, that's very important. And just so the listeners know that with the Antarctic Treaty, it's the Commission for <clears throat> the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Communities. <clears throat> they have a meeting annually, which you have been a part of, I believe, for nearly 19 years. Yep. If for people to understand, like when the treaty got established in 1961, nobody will have thought, you know, that they would be fishing down there. Yep. So far away, so expensive to go there. I mean, all the fuel implications are very expensive and so on. But fair enough, you know, a fishery started on Antarctic growth. And that fishery was happening because it was a very heavily subsidized fishery. And it was being conducted by the URSSR, the Soviet Union then. And so people started to be very concerned about this. Scientists working especially on Antarctic growth. And so they started talking about creating a mechanism, an agreement, in order to manage the activities in the water, because nobody was thinking, you know, who will be doing things in the water down there? And that's when CAMELAR, the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, was established in 1982. And it was established because of the krill fishery, and so in some circles, they still call it the krill convention. Oh. And, and this krill convention, the area to which the convention applies, because every international agreement is an area to which the agreement applies, is all the area of the Antarctic Treaty, but also some areas to the north in a way to include in that area the sub-Antarctic islands like South George and South Sandwich, Kirkland Crosset, Herd McDonald, which do belong to some of the nations, which are all Kamala members. But although they belong to those countries, the Camelar regulations, which are called conservation measures, apply, I mean, do that voluntarily, they apply in the water. So the, the Camelar Convention covers a much larger area than the treaty. And basically, as I said at the beginning, it is the responsibility of the, the commission, which is the political body that directs or manages the convention, the management of any fishery activity, and that includes also Antarctic and Patagonian toothfish. And it also has the, the responsibility to establish marine protected areas. So these are two of the key responsibilities of the commission. I went down to Hobart in 2012, and it wasn't till 2016 that the Ross Sea became the first marine protected area. And it is the world's largest marine protected area. And there's three others on the table which... Must be incredibly frustrating for yourself. You've been involved for so long with the geopolitical nonsense that goes on. There's a lot of science that comes to the table, but as a layperson myself, 
it just makes complete sense, common sense to me, to have it managed. But it's all about the money. And it's the Russians and the Chinese that are blocking the potential for going forward, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you for bringing this up because that's it's one of the, the key issues. As you said, in 2012, when you came and we met, and it was absolutely incredible to meet you there. We started this kind of friendship that went for the next 10 years. At that time, we were working on pushing, promoting the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area and also the East Antarctic Marine Protected Area, which is basically lies in the, in the projection of Australia. And so we started kind of focusing on this probably on 2011. 2012, kind of, you know, we were all excited, you know, this is going to happen. And it took us another four or five years until 2016, as you said, in order to get the Rossi in place. And and I always remember the day we got the Rossi, I was so shocked. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't even express my joy. Yeah. Because I couldn't believe it that we managed, that we got it. And so it was the highlight in my professional career to get that marine protected area, which is the largest marine protected area in the world. At the same time, East Antarctica, which started to be discussed and negotiated uh, also in 2011, we still do not have it. And it's in the hands of the commission yeah. because normally for the audience, any marine protected area starts with a technical proposal. A member, like that is a nation or a, or a couple of nations, will prepare a proposal based on the best science available. They will work, you know, through a lot of workshop meetings and working group meetings, which are the technical branch, if you want, from the convention, until you get to the scientific committee, which is the committee where all the scientists from the individual nations are sitting. And when they say this is the best science available, that proposal moves into the hands of the commission. And at that point, this is only a political decision. And so with, with Eastern Antarctica, it's on the hands of the commission for the last 10 years, and we are, and it's not moving forward. And as you were said, it's because it's being blocked by Russia and China. It's also important for the audience to know that every single decision in, in Camelot it's done by consensus, meaning everybody has to agree. And when I say everybody, we're talking about 25 nations and the European Union. Mm -hmm. So 26 members, as they call yeah. it. So Eastern Antarctica is in the hands of the Commission. Then we have another proposal for the Weddell Sea, which is the area that lies to the east of the Antarctic Peninsula. Antarctic Peninsula is a projection of the southern hemisphere into Antarctica. So it's a very nice and well-shaped peninsula. So all the water to the east, the Antarctic Peninsula, is the Weddell Sea. That proposal also lies in the hands of uh, the Commission. And then the third proposal, because you mentioned the three proposals, is the proposal for what is called the Antarctic Peninsula, or Domain 1, which is kind of our internal name it's given. And this is the waters to the west of the Antarctic Peninsula. And that proposal is still in the hands of the scientific committee. And I will add something more there, which is important for people to understand, that when the scientific committee meets, it's about science. And so discussion should be based on science. Yeah. But we've been seeing in many years now, like I would say six, seven, eight years, what is called the politicization of the scientific committee. It means the politics start to be part of the discussions. Normally they are covered under or undercover uh, in science and because science is full of uncertainties, because that's the nature of science, you know, uncertainty and the political speech will be used in order to block the progress. And progress in that case will mean moving that proposal from the scientific committee into the commission. And so this is where we are right now. And, and the two main nations that are blocking all this are Russia and China. And I would say probably the reason why they're doing that differs from one country to the other. Russia is more about geopolitics. And, and I will say that for Russia to exercise its veto power, it's a way of showing power when probably they don't have so much power, or at least they're not doing so many things in Antarctica that you say, oh, you know, they're a powerful nation in Antarctica. And when it comes to China, it's different. China is always not very happy about having any restrictions on fishing grounds. It's a different game, but at the end of the day, you know, both countries are blocking one way or the other. So how hopeful are you this year? 
<laughs> oh my gosh, you're asking those very complicated questions. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't say this year I was in general. I mean, there's some days and the, some times of the year in which I feel frustrated. And then, you know, I take a big a breath and then I continue pushing for this. And you never know what's going to happen in Camelot. Everything could happen because if there is a political will, if there are instructions from the capital, then things could happen overnight. So it's always this. Hopefully, you know, this year this will happen, or at least something will happen, like one of the proposals will be agreed. So there's always this kind of hope. Of course, there's a lot of frustration. Like I said, after almost 20 years of going to Camelot and sitting there and, and making such a slow progress, especially in the last 10 years, the way I deal with that is that if you really care about Antarctica, and Antarctica Marine Protected Areas is a huge thing to accomplish. And the time to act is now. Mm. So you can wait for, for later. And so even if you're frustrated, even if sometimes you're not so hopeful, you have to do it now. You have to put all your energy, all your brain, all your, you know, your body, because you're sitting there too many long hours sometimes until early in the morning. So you have to find your inner energy in order to continue pushing for this, because this is the time. I mean, this is time in history. In the history of the human being, this is the time to get the job done. And so we have to do it. Absolutely. And with um, increasing temperatures and climate change and ice melting and things, you can't let go when you're passionate about something. And you're a marine biologist and a wildlife conservationist. And you have a love for everything Antarctica. So you moved away from the doctorate side of things and, and more into bridging the conservation. What was it that actually instigated that for you? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. It you know, provides for a lot of talking. Yeah, like you said, I'm a marine biologist, so I, I follow kind of the, the academic career. So I, I got my PhD, I got a postdoc. Basically, I was working at that time on the diving behavior and foraging areas of sea lions in Patagonia. And I was, you know, being the typical researcher. But then at one point, I thought, you know, research is good. It's very important. But probably for myself, you know, I would like to be more the, the bridge between the science and the policy. And so, and this is what I've been uh, doing over the last 20 years. I was moving from being the researcher to become this bridge, this facilitator between the science and the, the policy. I understand the science, I understand the scientists, so I can relate to them, I can talk to them. And then I try to use the best science available in order to get the right policy in place. And I know how to talk to the policy people. And I'm from Argentina, I lived in Germany, I lived in the U.S., I lived in Canada, I lived in Spain. So I have also this long international experience in, in dealing with different cultures and languages and so on, which I also use, you know, to, you know, because you have to understand people when you're talking to them. And because sometimes, you know, there's some cultural barriers that you have to be aware yeah. of. And so I'm, I'm very happy with what I'm doing because I think that this is something that um, lies very close to what I can do to my skills and so on. So I'm very glad that I'm doing this. And in having said that, and going back to your comments about climate change you know, and the increase in temperatures, that's a very important thing that you're saying, because Antarctica is not a place in which you produce a lot of CO2. Of course, you have the research stations, you have ships going and, and planes you know, going back and forth, but you know, it's minimal compared to what is being produced somewhere else. Having said that, it's important to move into more clean energies in Antarctica, of course, uh, if you want as an example of the things that you should do right. But Antarctica, although it's not producing so much CO2, is one of the places in the world that is most affected by climate change, particularly by global warming. And so you have some areas in Antarctica in which you know people might argue that there is you're getting more ice. Yes, of course, there are some areas because this is an ecosystem that is changing a big continent and that is being affected by winds, by currents, by a lot of meteorological oceanographic features. But there's some areas, for example, like in the Antarctic Peninsula, and that's where the Antarctic curl fishery concentrates. And in that area is one of the areas in the world in which we've seen a much larger increase in temperature. And we're talking about water temperature and air temperature. So what are the effects of that? Like, you know, in Antarctica, you have two types of ice. You have the, the freshwater ice, which is basically precipitation, like 
rain, snowing, and so on. And that then constitutes all the glaciers. So you have all these huge mountains in some areas, like in the peninsula area, with these huge hanging glaciers. And, and of course, these glaciers, you know, they move uh, down the hill into the water. And then, you know, when they break, uh, you get all these icebergs. They start to move. And some, they get stuck, but others, they move. And so you have these the well-known glaciers. And that's fresh water. But then you have the ice that is made out of the ocean, the seawater that frozes during the winter. And that ice normally is a thin layer. I mean, sometimes not so thin, but very flat area compared to the glaciers. And so with the increase in sea temperature and air temperature, we're seeing a decrease in the amount of sea ice. And that decrease is not only that you're getting less sea ice, but that sea ice stays in a much shorter time, like not so many months. An example of how this affects fishery, the crow fishery used to be a summer fishery. So the fishery would start in the north, in the waters of South Georgia, and then would move south as the uh, sea ice was retreating. But nowadays, it became a, a year-round fishery because the ships, they can go to the Antarctic Peninsula no matter when. So that's how it relates to the fishery. Mm. How it relates, for example, to krill, just to give you the audience a, a little taste of the life cycle of krill. The krill female, they will lay the eggs at the end of summer. And so the, the eggs, they will go into deep waters, far away from the, the parental stock. Because, you know, otherwise, you know, parents, they could feed on the egg. So the eggs, they will go into deep waters. We're talking about 1,000 to 1,000 meters, depending on the area. Wow. And then they will start going through different 11 larvae stages. So they're changing in size, in shape. And as they do, they move up in the water column. So by the end of the cycle, the krill is swimming free at the top of the surface of the water. But when you have the sea ice, what they do, they feed on sea ice algae. That is very tiny unicellular algae that live attached to the ice. So basically they're grazing on the ice from below. And so, um, and this is the, the main source of food for krill. So when you have less sea ice in the area, mm. that means you have less sea ice algae, and that means availability of krill uh, might be reduced in some areas. So sea ice is very much connected to that. And in talking about temperatures also, for example, in the Antarctic Peninsula, and that's something I've been talking to some researchers because I had the feeling you're starting to see more precipitation in the form of rain. Antarctica is one of the driest places in the world. Mm. But in this area, which was dry in the past, it's becoming more humid. So you're, you're getting more rain. And so rain could have some effects probably, for example, on the penguin chicks, you know, during the breeding season, because they have this down, these feathers, which are very good as an insulation layer when they're dry, but not when they're wet. And so you get all these chicks getting wet, which is so they freeze, some of them might die. And so it's like you start to putting a lot of pressure on the different species and so on. Mm. And, and of course, there is no one reason why things happen, but the combination of all this in a changing ecosystem that calls for some concerns. And so in, in sometimes you think there's nothing we can do about climate change in Antarctica because the changes are not being produced there. But because this is happening, you have to be extra precaution about whatever you do because yep. the system is under pressure. So what can we do to, to <clears throat> actually help? Yeah, that's a good question. And since Antarctica is so far away, you say, oh, what can I do here at home, you know, when Antarctica is so far? I would say there are two, in my view, and this is my personal view, there are two types of things you can do. Some things that are related, if you want, directly to Antarctica. And in that case, that means be aware about what's happening, to be interested, to spread the world, to talk to your kids. Kids are very important because they are the future. I mean, that generation is the one that will need to finalize the job, I would say. And so one thing is to be aware, to talk about this, to spread the word, to make people aware, to educate about this. And so with all this in mind, when governments have to take decisions, like for example, when New Zealand was uh, promoting the Ross Sea, it's very important what the public think. Because, you know, the politicians, they are accountable for what they're doing. And so whatever you can do at any political level uh, in order to get your own country to take the right decisions, that's a very important thing. Even if for you it feels like distant, but, you know, the sum of the parts helps to, to move things. 
especially if it's something that has been done at the international level. Many of these decisions about the Antarctic marine protected areas are being taken at a very, very high level. And when I say high level, it goes all the way to the, the president or the prime minister. And so the more pressure from the public uh, there is on those political figures, the more accountable they are, the more they will need to do something. It will be good for them. They will look good. So this is uh, a bit how that works. And that's when it comes to specific things about Antarctica. But then, of course, we're talking about the environment in general. So even if you're doing something at a very local level, like in, in your river, in your coast, in the way you manage your trash, in, in the way you use your water and the heat and the energy, and, you know, that's important because this is, like you said, it's only one ocean. So whatever happens in the river goes into the ocean, and then the ocean, it's one ocean. Uh, plastics. Plastic is a huge thing that we're starting to see microplastics in the Southern Ocean. And this is far away from the source of those mm. plastics. Mm. And so I think there are two levels. Like one thing that you can do having Antarctica as your target, if you want. And the other thing is just to be careful and to be aware and very empathetic about the environment, about the other species, other humans. And, and so I think that these are the different levels that you have to be um, aware and, and do something. There's always a little thing that you can do. And that little thing, it's important. That is great that you say that because that's what I'm always trying to do is to encourage my listeners. Like Jane Goodall says, it's turning off a switch or something and recognizing everything has a knock on effect. You say something about Jane Goodall. I will tell you a very short story that I know you will like. Cool. When I was doing my PhD, I was working on more in the lab, you know, working on biochemical adaptations and physiological adaptations and so on. And, and I was wondering whether I should go back to the field or not. And that was in Germany. And I went to see a lecture of Jane Goodall. I was invited by one of my professors. And so I went there and watched at the lecture. I talked to Jane Goodall for one second. She will not remember me. In, in <laughs> case. I was a young student then. But that lecture, Jane Goodall was like, the reason why I said I should go back to the field and I should continue working on these kind of things, not in the lab, but in nature. And then I decided to, to go and, and work on the ecology and the, the diving behavior of uh, silent sea lions. So I moved to Canada to do a postdoc on that. And so I was based in Canada at the University of Guelph, close to Toronto, in Ontario. And But I would go every single year to Patagonia, to the south, and, and work on sea lions in the Peninsula Valdez which is a very uh, well-known place for southern right whales, too. I mean, this is the place where they breed. So elephant seals, southern elephant seals, I was also working on, and also a bit on Magellanic penguins. But southern sea lion was like my big gig there. And I always remember that night with that lecture from Jane Goodall. So, so what was it Goodall. about her that inspired you? You know, I was working in the lab. You know, I was doing all this laboratory work, which, you know, can be, for me, at least boring. And I was very interested in the result from my work and how different animals were coping to you know, different physiological problems. But I was confined in the lab. And, and then watching her work in the field uh, with the chimps there, and it was like, oh, yeah, I would like to go back. So something kind of was ignited again in myself. So that's and how it all started. And I said, you know, I have to follow my passion and, yep. and go back to the field. And I think that's what fuels you both. She came to New Zealand about four or five years ago, and she must have, like David Attenborough as well, must have seen so many rapid changes and been frustrated by the politics of everything. And I remember one of the things that Jane was talking about was to actually, as you mentioned earlier, to have an understanding and the grounding in the cultures to see where the people are coming from in order to work together and create the solutions rather than going in there and dictating to people. And that is a big lesson, whatever walk of life you happen to be in or, you know, whatever scenario you find yourself in, it's phenomenal. So the passion is an underlying thing. So is there a book or a person that has really influenced you? I would say a person, a person that I never met, but uh, I was strongly influenced by, by Jacques Cousteau. Right. When I was a very young person, I used to watch the Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau that was running from 68 to 70-something, 70 76, I guess. And I was amazed, you know, about 
the things that we're doing, you know, the places that we're going with the Calypso, it was the name of uh, the vessel. And I was watching the shows in black and white. Yeah. But my brain remembers them in color. <laughs> very, very funny. And, and I was amazed about the underwater world. And so that really made me study marine biology. It was a strong, very strong influence. And having said that, then I started to work on Antarctica. And recently, I was watching again the episodes of Cousteau in Antarctica that happened 40 years ago. And I think there are like four episodes. It's amazing the things these people were doing there with no marine charts, no communications, almost no maps, and the quality of the things they were doing. Of course, you know, some of the things they were saying nowadays, they will not be sustained by any science. But the way he was communicating all this and inspiring people, I mean, that really got me. And recently, like last year, because of my work, I started to collaborate on different things with Philippe Cousteau Jr., oh. which is the nephew of Jacques Cousteau. And for me, it was like, it is like closing a circle in my life. Wow. And so I'm, I'm very, very happy. And then I always think that to have met you, you know, the great granddaughter <laughs> And James Clark Ross is like another, you know, big thing in my life. Like, you know, I'm meeting all these people that, you know, are connected. One of the first places I went when I was, and that was by chance, when I was doing, um, I started working on conservation, like moving away from science into conservation. I went to visit like French researcher. And he was doing research on a place, it's called Les Grands Cons Bleu, which is a place out of Marseille in France. And so I went with him there for a day on a little boat. And that was the first place where Jacques Cousteau started doing his exploring. So it was like, you know, all these things happening in my life. I, I like those stories. Absolutely. Yeah. We were talking before we came on air about the serendipity. I mean, we're both the same age. We're 61 and we were born in 61, which was when the Antarctic Treaty came about. And you were telling me about the significant times back in 82 when, was it Camelot came yeah. about? And yeah, then the environmental yeah, protocol in 91 were times when you actually finished your studies and things. Yes, when you look back and reflect on things, how things were actually meant to be, it's phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, like, And I like that because it gives a special touch to your life. I was meant to do this thing. Yeah. It's good. I, well, I see one of your great strengths is your congeniality and passion, really, that actually sees you through and that's something that I admire in the likes of um, Jane Goodall. There are people who have had the tenacity for the long stay and not getting on a soapbox and shouting and screaming. And it's having that staying power, which is the momentum is actually the underlying passion and the early influences. And I can remember Jack Cousteau and watching it on black and white as well. What he was doing was amazing. And then I look at my ancestor. They just followed the stars and the Earth's magnetic field and there were no charts. And it's just amazing. The spirit mm -hmm. and the adventure and the courage is just phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And I have always, like, since I was a kid, I mean, I was really attracted by polar explorers. And I always wanted to go to Antarctica when I was a very small child, but not because somebody had told me anything about that place, but I always felt very attracted I always went there, part of my military service in Argentina, which was compulsory. I was 18 years old, so but I ended up in the north of Argentina, very far from Antarctica. But I was very close to go to Antarctica, <laughs> and I was so happy because, I mean, I didn't want to go to be drafted into the military regime for a year. But I thought, okay, if I, if I have to, if it's Antarctica, then okay, I mean, that would be good. Is there a quote or something that you find motivating that inspires you? Yeah, I think you will like it. It's uh, by a German poet and writer. And so I will say it first in German to provide my respect to Erich Kästner. And he said, Nur wer erwachsen wird und ein Kind bleibt, ist ein Mensch. And that means in English, only those who grow up and remain a child are human. Love it. <laughs> and that's a quote that I always keep in mind because I think that Remaining like a child or, or not losing your child touch helps you in life to be inspiration and, and, and to inspire other people too. It's the curiosity and having fun and playing as well because you've got that wicked uh, sparkle in your eye anyway. So. <laughs> thank you. For people that are not seeing us, I have 
In my background, I have a laughing crab eater seal that I guess has also some sparkling. Um, it's an absolute yeah. classic. So I'm sure over time you have been frustrated and felt very down. So what <clears> do you do to lift yourself up? Yeah, and, and when it comes to frustration, you know, there, there are frustration in work, there are frustration in personal things, like, you know, like every other human. So what I do, I always go into nature. I live in a place that you know, I'm surrounded by nature. But, you know, I live in places where I was not surrounded by nature. In those cases, I would go to a park. But here I go to nature, I go, you know, hiking, walk, go to the lake, uh, in the forest. So I can go, like, for a walk. And that helps me a lot. I take my backpack and just go by myself. And also, I go for a run. Run always, for me, is a very good thing because it makes my brain work in a way that it doesn't work, you know, when I'm walking or when I'm sitting. I know where right. if it's the oxygen pump or whatever is happening in my brain, but uh, many of good ideas that I have, they come when I go for a run. And, and it really changes the way I feel when I'm coming back from, from a run. And yeah. that's one thing. The other thing I do, which is a bit different, I write poetry. So I was going to bring that my, up earlier when you mentioned the, the quotes. I've seen yeah, some. It's beautiful. Wrote, at the beginning of the pandemic, I published a book. It's about the living in spring. It's in Spanish, of course, and with like 50 uh, of my poems. And and I always say, you know, I don't know if they're good or bad, but I really, really enjoy writing them. I enjoy the feeling of having an empty page and then having a poem that reflects your feelings and your thinking. And you can go back later on, uh, years thereafter, and look at the poem and say, oh, that poem, you know, that really touches me or it's a good thing. And that helps me also to channel, you know, some of my frustration. So in my poems, they go about nature, they go about love, they go all the kind of poetic. Have you always written poetry or is there something that inspired you to begin with? I write nonfiction. And I've had a go at poetry, but I must have been influenced by a crappy teacher in my school years. And I just can't go yeah. there. <laughs> I mean, I, I like that you're writing science fiction. I'm, I'm starting to write a novel about the history of my grandfather coming from Germany, and which is part true and part fiction. And cool. so I'm playing with a lot of things. It's, it's a funny thing. But coming back to the question of poetry, it's a very good question. And, you know, I would have never thought that it would happen like it did. I never wrote poetry, never, uh, not a single poem. And back in 2011, I was here in, in Bariloche, the, the city where I live. I live kind of surrounded by hills. I, I dropped my kids at school and I wanted to see the, the sunrise from the hill. I drove my track to the up of the hill, and from there you can see the mountains to the left, and to the right you see the step, like a very flat area. And the sun, of course, comes from the east, and I was in the lake in the middle. And I was staying there, it was uh, dark, the light was starting to come, and suddenly you see this very golden light coming from the east. And then suddenly, when it goes up the small hills, it's just lighting all the lake and the mountain. And that moment was like, oh my God. And so... I went back home, I sit down, and I wrote a poem. It was called, like, in, I mean, the, the title was in English, and the title, of course, was Here Comes the Sun. <laughs> and But the poem was in Spanish, and I would say it was a very rough, primitive poem. But I started writing poem that day, and it was like opening a faucet. And since then, I started to write poem and poems, and it was like, like that. And suddenly I, I felt, wow, there is this thing that I can do. And I would say, I write poems for me, for nobody, for everybody. So I don't care. I mean, of course, if you read a poem and say, oh, I like to poem, you feel good. But it's like, you know, and I, I found there a very personal way to express myself. And I love it. I love words. It's connecting to yourself and find it oh, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. And Because you have all these feelings and thoughts in your brain and so on. The moment you put them into a page, you organize them and you think, oh my God, this is, oh yeah, this is what I'm feeling. Mm. And also, I have a blog poem in Spanish. Uh, it's called You Must Believe in Spring. That's in English. And then I have a blog about monologues. I just wrote like a few of them. And one of them, it's about, I mean, the translation will be when you lose a friend. It happened that I, like a couple of years ago, like in three months in a row, January, February, March, Every month I lost a very good friend, like wow. a cancer or whatever, very young people. And I was so moved by all this. So I wrote this monologue about, you know, losing friends. And that really helped me to kind of channel all these feelings 
and, and to share that with other people that might be in or might have been in a situation like that. You know, so they connect with that. And, and so I think this connecting thing also with other people that, you know, they have the feeling they don't have to write it. They like to read it. And but suddenly they see themselves reflected in, yeah. in those poems or writing. And I think this connecting aspect of writing, I think it's important, at least for me. Well, I think any kind of artistic expression, whether it happens to be music or painting or writing or something like that, is a vital element for everybody's life. But people tend to put it off till later. And as you say, I mean, sometimes we don't even know it's there. You opened a faucet and not knowing, but to carry on. And as you said, it's really important to keep that aspect that you're doing it for you. Because I know at the beginning of my journey, I thought I could write this book and I'd be famous. And it was this massive ego got in the way of trying to do it right. I do daily journaling and things where I just write anything that comes, which is one way of um, releasing things. It's it's fantastic. That's fantastic. And another thing that uh, I'm remembering that all my life, I've been writing technical stuff, political yeah. stuff, always constrained by the science, you know, doing the science right, constrained by the right word, don't say this, or this, and finding the right balance in words and so on. When you write poetry, you know, when I write poetry, for me it was like, this is freedom. Yes. Because I can write one word and call it a poem. I'm free to do that. And that freedom in writing in my own language, because most of what I write is in English, but writing Spanish, it was like, oh my gosh, this is this is a walk in the forest. This is <laughs> this is freedom. And actually, I, I talk about walking the forest, climbing the mountains, you know, the river, the water. And like you said, any artistic expression is so important. And the magic of having an empty page and sometime thereafter having, a, let's say, a poem. So the poem, it's an entity in itself. Yeah. And you will die, and that point will remain there. If something has been created, doesn't matter whether it's good or bad, it's there. And that happens to me with my grandfather, the father of my mother. He used to write poems in Spanish and in German, too. And so I, I read some of the things that he wrote. Like, he was a teenager. He spent long summers in, in the south of Patagonia in the 1920s. And so you read, you know, the feelings he had as a teenager back then in the middle of nowhere. And it's amazing. And I can connect with my grandfather because I can read that. So I think it's, I would say, a gift for your kids and your grandkids. I think it's so lovely because it's really about the essence of who we are, the soul of who we are. As you were saying, you know, you're constrained by the role. And so many people identify themselves with specific roles. It's the extra bits that we bring to the role that make us who we are. Yeah, it allows you to use other parts of your brain. I, yeah. For example, uh, once a week I go to take singing classes. Wow. And, yeah, and this is it's one hour I spend with my teacher, which is another, you know, walk in, into freedom. And you learn so many things, not only by singing, but also by talking about music. And it's like a nice walk into your brain in different areas of your brain, because otherwise you're confined to the intellectual, you know, methodological, technical, political parts of your brain. My daughter says, you can dance, mum, but please don't sing in public. (laughs) So I do it in the shower. Actually, it's the breathing which is so important. When you're singing, you learn to breathe from really deep because we're very shallow breathers. Yeah, and actually connecting what you say about ego and air and all this, when I turned 50, I thought I have to do something with myself in order to move away from my ego. With age, my ego will get more solid. And so I said, I'm going to go to do something that will destroy my ego. And it will also allow me to express, to exhale my air. And I started to learn how to play saxophone. Wow. And so my ego was destroyed because it's complicated. But I was able to blow, like, you know, to exhale my air and with all this passion. But then, you know, it was difficult to sustain that because of my trauma and so on. You're going to be playing saxophone everywhere. So and then I moved into singing which I can control it better so I can sing here and there. And, and probably the reason why I decided to go for it, because I've always been like your daughter. I would tell you, oh, please don't sing in public. And um, but one day I was driving in my track with my daughter. And so I was singing in the, in the track. Like I said, hey, daddy, you don't think so bad. And I thought, nice. oh, good. <laughs> so I said, okay, let's. And I started to learn how to, to sing. And I love it. And I'm, you know, I'm not 
looking to become a, a professional singer no, no, at all on anything. But I, I like the hour in, in my week is fantastic. Actually, I, I invite everybody, all the audience, to go and, and take singing lessons because it's a free mechanism. Absolutely. In fact, my guest a couple of weeks ago, she's a singer, songwriter and musician. She can play every kind of music. So talented. Wow. So just to round things off, then, if I was your fairy godmother and could grant you one wish in the world, what would it be and why? I've been thinking about this lately. And I think that what I will change in this world is to make people to be more empathetic, empathetic about the environment empathetic about other species, empathetic about other humans. Because I think that if we exercise empathy for all this and we think uh, about every action we do, every single action we do with this empathy in mind, I think this world will become a much better world. Because so many of the things that are happening are related to, you know, not being empathetic to other cultures, to other needs, to other people, to species, uh, not caring about the environment. So I think that if you can, with your magic touch, you can change that and make the world be more empathetic, that would be great. And I think we will have a world that will be more, uh, we have more social environmental equality. And, and I think that that would be my wish, empathy. I think it's the big word. So that really ties in beautifully with the essence of what the podcast is about. It's about building the relationship between people and the planet and in that it's being able to walk in the shoes and to respect and have reverence for everything and its part in the whole system, really. So fantastic. What a way to round it off. Thank you very much for your time, yeah, Rodolfo. It's been no, an absolute I'm, pleasure. We could do a, no, a me, truthful a, episode. We can do another episode. We can have many episodes. And <laughs> for me, it's a, it's a great way to start my day. So I'm very happy. Well, we'll be kicking off World Krill and, Day. because I was going to say... Yeah, I'm in New Zealand, so we're in the future, so we're going to be kicking off the day fantastically. Exactly. So for the audience, 11 August is the day. So please look for any cruel stories and spread the word about this fantastic creature. Bless you. Thank you for your time. Take yeah. care. Bye. No, thank you. You take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. A huge thanks to Rodolfo for his tireless efforts to protect Antarctica and for being part of the great initiative for World Krill Day. They certainly deserve to be in the limelight for the magic they perform to sustain the health of our entire ecosystem. Don't forget you can help by signing the petition to show your support for the three marine protected areas in Antarctica. There's a link at the bottom of the show notes. You can talk about what you've learned with your family, friends and social networks and be sure to share this episode to give Krill the kudos they deserve. As Rodolfo said, the time is now. We can't leave it to chance. If we each step up to protect Krill and Antarctica, we can collectively build resilience to combat the impact of climate change. In next week's episode, I'm talking to Will Stevens from Mungify, who's ingeniously mixed his practical skills with plastic waste, creating revolutionary patio plant pots that help him make a difference while making a living and serving his community. Make sure you follow or subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on future episodes. And remember, all feedback and reviews are much appreciated, as are your suggestions for subjects or guests you'd like me to consider. Just email me on info at philiparos.com. So until next week, dig deep, open your mind to a world of possibilities, live life with a generous heart and take steps to minimise waste and maximise your own potential. Mm -hmm.